what's going on, everybody? Welcome to episode 52, right? 52 of the podcast. 52. Um, 52, let's do it, man. Uh, first and foremost, we apologize about last episode. <laughs> we made some visual um, references, but the video didn't work. So we're using a different software now to hopefully get that video. What do you think? 50% chance it works out this time? We'll see. It's a roll of the dice for sure. Yeah, it's, it's a coin flip right now. So we'll see. We apologize. Um, but yeah, we appreciate you tuning in. Um, we're going to be talking about some velocity loss related stuff. And I'll be honest, when Zach wrote the newsletter, I thought this was going to be, you know, a newsletter and a podcast episode that was going to primarily just be interesting for Zach and I. And, Saltine crackers, baby. <laughs> <laughs> and a lot of listeners might, it, it might not be like the most enticing to a wide range of people, but um, when Zach posted about some of this stuff on his Instagram page, got a good amount of, of really productive conversation going and also gave us some ideas for, for things to talk about. And even if you don't use velocity in your training, I think there's a lot of um, useful things that we're going to talk about here, if we do say so ourselves, um, because it's going to kind of intersect at, at you know different training variables of proximity to failure, volume, um, auto regulation in general. So, you know, the, the kind of more feedback we got on this newsletter, the more optimistic I got about this podcast episode. So I think it'll be a good one. Um, I definitely have some some ideas that Zach and I have briefly talked about before hitting record here that I think we'll dive into that I'm excited to talk about and I hope you guys are excited to tune into. Uh, before I kick it over to Zach to let him take over here, um, first and foremost, if you're not already subscribed to the Training Takeaway newsletter, you can go ahead and do so um, at the description or whatever in YouTube or po your podcast player of choice should be right there. Um, we'll send you an evidence-based of some sort newsletter every couple of weeks. And um, you'll also get early access to, to all the stuff we kind of put out um, for for purchase and all the good content and stuff that we, we try to make available for you guys. You can also check out the other things we offer in the description as well, including our different coaching and programming options. So with that out of the way, Zach, I'll kick it over to you, let you go through this recent study by Chew Kitchen colleagues and we can we can roll from there. And I should probably start off just because I know we kind of like to jump right into the weeds. Maybe we should just quickly define what velocity loss is just to make sure we're on the same page. For sure. Yep. That's that's exactly how I was going to start too. Um, so like Josh said, the kind of the topic of today's discussion is going to be centered around velocity loss. So velocity loss has gotten a ton of, you know, recent press in the research and, and also I'd say in a good amount in kind of the strength sport community. And at, in a very basic level, what it is measuring with one of the uh, linear position transducers or, you know, a fancy name for a velocity tracker that you kind of hook onto the bar. Basically, what you're measuring is the change in velocity of a repetition from the fastest rep of a set to the last rep in the set. And using some basic math, you can kind of create a percentage change in that velocity that is generally going to go down as kind of um, the set progresses and you get closer to failure. That's the concept of velocity loss. And like I said, there's been a ton of research on this topic, whether it's longitudinal outcomes and how do different velocity loss thresholds um, influence strength, hypertrophy, power, et cetera. Also acute fatigue. So how does a given velocity loss threshold lead to decrements in performance or even, you know, blood markers, things like that. And then also like longitudinal neuromuscular adaptations like rate of force development, et cetera, that we've discussed all three of those on the show um, in, in, in previously. Um, however, we haven't really got into kind of some more of the logistics of use a lot, using, using velocity loss as like a day-to-day -day method to kind of prescribed training, which is really what this um, newsletter was about. Uh, the recent study that we're going to talk about by Jukic and colleagues kind of looks at some session to session, um, uh, you know, stability of velocity loss and its ability to um, kind of reference a stimulus for a training session, I guess is the simplest way you could kind of put it. Um, and so that, that was really what we focus on here. But that, like you said, that has a ton of kind of downstream implications on what this could and could not be useful for. Um, so the, fir the first thing I want to say, like you mentioned, I also thought this was going to be a, a relatively dry newsletter, um, if, if, if I'm being totally honest. But 
I thought it was interesting for a variety of reasons, and it got some really good discussion going on social media. So one of the one of the things I I guess I I had in the back of my head while writing this, but I didn't make explicitly clear is kind of our perspective and how that influences how we kind of may view these results. So I guess to to, to spill the beans a little bit, the the study by Jukic and colleagues for the most part in terms of the analysis that we focus on show that there's some pretty considerable variability in a given velocity loss threshold for a person. You know, if you do that on Monday and you do that on a, uh, like a, a Thursday, a given velocity loss threshold is for all intents and purposes going to deliver a different proximity to failure than, you know, both, both times. And because of that, the kind of the presupposition that we have in terms of the way that we view training and kind of what is the thing to prioritize is that proximity to failure is really what we want to, to uh, relate to set termination. So whatever, whatever method you choose, the reason you're going to terminate a set is because you're reaching the desired proximity to failure for the most part. And so that's important to kind of state on the front end because with that knowledge, that kind of shapes our interpretation of this data because velocity loss isn't a perfect, um, you know, gauge of proximity to failure. It definitely approximates it, you know, higher velocity loss thresholds are going to lead to sets being terminated closer to failure, but there's variability there for sure. Um, and you probably have access to other methods that we'll discuss that are, have a tighter relationship. But because we have that presupposition, that would lead us to say, we probably want a different set termination method. What that doesn't mean is that velocity loss has absolutely zero application. And just because we don't think it's a great way to terminate sets based on the presuppositions that we hold, if you don't agree to those, you may view this in a slightly different manner, which we'll discuss. But like I said, ultimately, at, at a simplest level, the, the study from Jukic and colleagues shows that, you know, if you take a given individual and you have them perform uh, a set to failure with, you know, a, a given load, the velocity loss slash RAR relationship uh, for, for all intents and purposes seems to have some considerable variability, which from our perspective makes it probably not the best way to actually terminate your sets on a day-to-day -day basis. So what I mean by that is when you're actually on the gym floor and you're, you're doing sets of bench press, probably isn't the best idea to terminate your set literally because it reached a, a given velocity loss threshold, thinking that that is a really good proxy of RAR. That probably isn't a super tight relationship, specifically in free weight exercises, and that's an important caveat. Um, the the research on Smith Machine is is definitely um, seems to be seems to be a tighter relationship there, but I would argue it's still not the best method that we have access to. Um, in addition to that, just thinking about the logistics in terms of utilizing velocity loss as a set termination method, it kind of just gets pretty cumbersome. Um, so we know from other research that velocity loss thresholds, meaning in order to reach a given proximity to failure with a velocity loss threshold, it's individual specific, exercise specific, load specific, and probably set specific. So all of those things mean if you're really gonna utilize velocity loss as a set termination method with in mind that you're trying to control for proximity to failure pretty tightly, probably isn't the best method because you would have to account for all of those things changing. Um, so just as a basic example, a 20% velocity loss threshold doesn't mean the same proximity to failure between people, between exercises with different loads or different sets. It, you know, the greater sets are going to start with a lower velocity if you keep the load the same, and that could mean a different uh, proximity to failure because of that. Um, and so that, in addition to the fact that velocity-based methods obviously are costly, the, the you know, I would say most... Um, LPTs that are pretty solid around three, 400 bucks nowadays, I think. Um, so the, all, all those things to consider, it, it would probably be my recommendation. If you care about what we care about, which is proximity to failure to control set termination, there's probably other methods that I would, I would recommend and we can get into those. Um, but I guess I'll stop there, Josh. That's just kind of the, the basic overview of kind of the results there. And then we can kind of get into what I really want to focus on in this podcast is kind of moving forward with some of the discussion that was on social media and kind of talking about the pros and cons and what it could be used for, what it may tell us, et cetera. Yeah. I thought that was well outlined, man. I, I'll i just propose a, a, a mini example here of some of the limitations. So 
you mentioned it was exercise specific. So for example, if you do 40% velocity loss with the same load on bench press and squat, that's going to lead to different RAR values, right? Like for example, there's a, this was in the Smith machine, which if anything is better um, than a free weight, like, like most listeners will be using um, with 70% of one RM um, and 40% velocity loss in a paper by Rodriguez, Roselle and colleagues. Um, that corresponded with an average of 2.3 RAR in the squat and 4.3 RAR in the Smith machine bench press. So you can see how 40% isn't 40% isn't 40%, right? So exercise specific, individual specific for sure, right? People's rates of decay throughout a set um, are going to be a little bit different. Maybe mine is a little bit steadier as I kind of lose velocity throughout the set. Maybe Zach's is, you know, he kind of hangs out without much velocity loss and then it kind of falls off. Now, this is a whole nother caveat that that might be a feature, not a bug of velocity loss. However, if we're operating under that, you know, kind of assumption that I think we hold and, and a lot of people listening to this hold is that we care about quantifying repetitions in reserve, at least for strength and physique type training, then again, there's that uh, individual specific limitation of velocity loss in quantifying reps in reserve. And then another really good example is like the set to set constraint that you mentioned as well. If I start a set and I'm fresh, let's say it's the first set of whatever, four, um, four sets with 70%. And my first rep is whatever, 0.5 meters per second. And I'm training to a 50% velocity loss just for easy math. Um, I would stop that set when I get to a 0.25 meter per second velocity loss or below. Um, and then let's say by the four set, I'm under a little bit of fatigue. So that first rep of that four set isn't going to be as fast because of that fatigue. Um, and let's say that first rep is now a 0.4 meter per second velocity. Then I'm going to stop the set at 0.2 meters per second or below. And as we're probably going to get to, it seems that there's a decent relationship between the absolute velocity and how many reps are left in the tank. So 0.25, I'm just making up numbers here. Don't read too much into them. 0.25 might be three reps in reserve, right? Whereas 0.2 could be zero to one reps in reserve. So you can see how that same 50% velocity loss led to a meaningfully different RER just as a result of that set to set fatigue. Um, and then loading specific, that one just gets really messy, right? Because we're almost always going to be training through different loading ranges. You might, if you're doing like a, a kind of traditional DUP type setup and you have a, you know, 80% day, 72 and a half percent day and a 65% day, um, and you're trying to use velocity loss and using it as an indication of RAR, you're more or less going to have to have profiles for every single, you know, I guess two and a half percent increment of load, every single set. Um, and obviously for that individual as well. Um, and, and for that exercise, obviously specifically. So if you're doing squat bench deadlifts with a setup like that, you would need just so an unbelievable amount of data that it, it probably wouldn't be useful again as a set termination method. We definitely don't want to sit here and say that velocity loss is bad. It's, it's really good. And, and, and I could definitely see the argument that, um, you know, in like a research setting, maybe if, if you have certain constraints with data collection and, you know, the kind of researcher to subject ratio. Also, if you're interested more in like, you know, you, maybe you are taking one RMs pre and post and muscle size pre and post, but they're actually soccer players and you actually care about how fast they're getting, or I don't know, there's some other athletes and they want to improve their vertical jump or some other measurement of athletic ability. Again, maybe velocity loss is really good. I want to be very clear that that's not what we're saying, but if you're using it to try to say as a way to control RAR, definitely not going to be the way to go. So hopefully I didn't go on too long there, but I hope that adds a little bit more context for those limitations that Zach outlined as to why, um, you know, velocity loss isn't great. And I didn't even get into the Jukic data, which only adds to those limitations. Yeah, ex exactly. Like that, that's, that's the long and short of it that we probably don't really need to, you know, continue to hammer home is that specifically for the context that we care about, which is using it as a proxy of RAR, it's pretty limited both in like it's, 
sheer accuracy, I would, I would say, but also just the logistical nature of setting something up that would even be remotely accurate in the first place, right? So it's yeah. it's kind of in both those ways, it, it's limited for ultimately the thing that we care about, which is terminating set based on a given RAR. I don't um, want to, sorry, I, I'm totally cutting you off, but <laughs> I, I figure you're going to kind of steer a different direction. Is that yeah. correct? Yeah. Yeah. I just want to pause here because I think it's worth at least talking about briefly. And again, I apologize, kind of throwing you off here, but um, it might be worth briefly talking about how different, or I, I hesitate to use this word bad, but just for lack of a better word, how bad that session to session reliability was in this Jukic paper. Um, we went back and forth a bunch kind of talking about the the graph that you made or the, or the figure you made for the newsletter, um, just to make sure we're on the same page about, you know, kind of what it was showing and, and what this actually means. Um, I can take a crack at it, but do you want to brief or just fr from a high level, right? Because if you're really interested, you can dive into the paper and look at yep. the newsletter specifically, but maybe just briefly going into what we're looking at with the figure in the newsletter. Sure. And again, kind of, you know, not to, not to get too much into it, but just how bad it was. Yeah. 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 So basically what, what, uh, the, the first, the first thing to say, and I want to make this really clear, uh, that this paper was like an extremely comprehensive analysis. It was very, very well done. Um, pretty much everything, you know, Ivan does, I'm going to call him Dr. Jukic because I, I don't even know if he has his PhD officially yet, but he, he, uh, definitely deserves the, uh, d deserves the title. He does really, really good work. And this was another example of him doing a very comprehensive analysis. So specifically what you're referring to and kind of the, the main thing I focused on for the newsletter was the agreement analysis that they performed. So, Basically, the way to interpret that figure is the first thing to notice is the um, the dotted lines in, in the in the figure that that um, I'll try to try to hopefully paint a picture in your head for the listeners. But the two dotted lines, the the authors selected those as kind of um, reasonable practical equivalence thresholds that if the velocity loss kind of variability session to session was within those. That would be that would be something that is reasonable and, and practical, and those were plus or minus kind of like ten percent on on each side of zero. Um, so what they actually found, and the way to kind of interpret the the analysis is they have kind of three dots for each of the loads that they looked at, and then there's uncertainty intervals around each of those. Um, basically, what you're looking at is do the limits of agreement, which are the top and the bottom dots, where are those in relation to those thresholds? And basically, the limits of agreement were extremely far outside of the equivalence um, kind of bounds, which based on, you know, obviously the, the equivalence thresholds are somewhat subjective on what is a, a reasonable amount of practical kind of similarity there. But they were extremely far outside of those. Um, and the exact numbers I don't have on hand, I don't believe those were directly reported. I couldn't find them, but in up, you know, upwards of, I, I can't remember exactly, I'm not looking at it directly here, but I believe the 90% uh, loading condition got all the way up to like 70% um, for the upper and lower uh, bounds uh, respectively. So that's like 60, you know, 60% greater than, than the uh, acceptable amount of uh, variability. So as Josh is saying, it's it's not like we're kind of taking a leap here and saying, oh, it was just a little bit poor. It was it was really really pretty inaccurate. Um, so again, contextualize within the fact that that's for what we care about doesn't necessarily mean it has no utility, but that variability in predicting the percentage of possible repetitions performed, which is essentially RAR. It's not exactly RAR, but basically, um, then that 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 was pretty. I think the exact wording in the paper was not acceptable agreement. Yeah, yeah. So just to again try to make things as practical as possible, if you're may, maybe you're using some other form of auto regulation, whether that's like percentage estimated one RM, or it's just a, a well well designed percentage based program or you're even auto-regulating percentage of 1RM based on velocity, which is something I think can be done very well. Um, we don't have to get into that now. But anyway, let's say you have 80% on the bar for your training program for a given session, right? And you do that in week one and week two, and you're stopping all sets um, at 30% velocity loss, right? Whatever the case is. You would expect that, okay, 80% 
let's say you can perform eight reps with that to failure. You would expect that if you were using a consistent velocity loss uh, week to week, that you would be stopping at a similar RIR, right? Whereas this is basically saying if I were to use 80% in week one and 80% in week two at the same velocity loss, that is subject to variability, that session to session variability to the point where it's going to tell me that velocity loss percentage is going to tell me to terminate a set at a considerably higher or lower RAR. And we're talking more than just one or two RAR values. That is just whatever, right? They, they kind of did that plus or minus 10% as their, to some degree, arbitrary cutoffs, which um, I think are reasonable. And it was way outside of that. Uh, so that's, that's what that means in practice. And that's just another limitation to lay on top of those other things that we hopefully made made somewhat clear in terms of exercise specific, individual specific, loading specific. Um, and I think I'm missing one like set to set specific, but hopefully we've we've made our point. Um, and I, I apologize for derailing us a bit, but I think that hopefully we made that pretty clear to the listener. For sure. So yeah, I, I think I think we've kind of made the case that it's probably not the best you know, way to go for a set termination, um, specifically when you're looking to control for RIR. Just to briefly hit on a few of the potential alternatives before we kind of go into where I want to take the rest of the podcast of like potentially talking about use cases of velocity loss and how we would actually, you know, view that in a positive light, I think. Um, you know, we've talked about these on the podcast before, but I would say kind of your two stock standard best approaches are going to be, you know, the one that's obviously freely available is just using um, subjective, you know, based RIR. This was a good question I got on uh, Instagram in response to the post was like, they were basically asking like, okay, you're saying that velocity loss is potentially not a super strong relation with RIR. But the question to them was, is it better than subjective RIR? And my response to that would be based on the data we have, specifically uh, meta-analysis from Halpern um, and colleagues, I would say that it probably is um, in, in the sense that if you are approximately one repetition off of, of your prediction based on the Halpern data, which is probably going to get worse as repetitions increase, but generally speaking, that was the overall estimate, that variability based on subjective prediction error is probably less than what we saw from the from the data from Jukic and colleagues. So I would say that is probably a better set termination method. And then also the absolute velocity thresholds that uh, we've spoken about before, but basically setting up a velocity profile with a with a set to failure, a couple sets to failure, et cetera. And then there's some you know additional steps that could go to kind of make it more robust. But generally speaking, you're going to use the velocities associated with each of those RIRs by kind of back calculating and using those as kind of your termination criteria that are more directly tied to the RIR um, rather than the velocity loss. I would say those are probably two of the better methods. Um, although I think Josh and I both frequently kind of tell clients to do the reps or like whatever the protocol is, and then just use those methods to retroactively kind of verify RIR rather than actually using them as set termination methods. So I would say in terms of like set termination methods, I think we don't use any really to very consistently. Maybe RIR for more like hypertrophy focused exercises, but um, if we're talking kind of the free weight movements and kind of the, the strength context, I would say probably don't use a explicit set termination method um, very often. It's usually just kind of arbitrary rep prescriptions and then using those retroactively, those methods, subjective RAR or absolute velocity to verify the, the RAR and make adjustments to load or repetitions um, to kind of get in the range uh, of what we want there. So those would be the kind of the alternatives that we might, might want to put on the table before we kind of get back to velocity loss and talk about some of the pros. Yeah, um, I do use RAR stops a good amount. Um, like you said, for something like, you know, back slots, bicep slots, kind of that, that kind of accessory work that isn't super specific. Um, I think that makes a lot of sense. Just essentially do a double progression type approach and just stop when you're at the desired um, RAR slash RPE. I also like to use them for back offsets, um, you know, and maybe it's like 75%. Um, what that could be a predefined load, right? Based on like their actual one RM or like a training max, or it could be 75% of, of estimated one RM based on a top set. There's a lot of ways to do it. And then just have the individual perform reps 
until they've reached a desired RP. Say it's an RP of eight, you just perform reps until you feel like you're at about two reps in reserve. Um, and then you, you stop the set. Now, I think it's important to keep in mind that that is not mutually exclusive from having a rep target. So the way that I think about this when I perform a protocol is like, okay, I generally know on each lift and lifters can quickly kind of pick up on what this is for themselves. If it's 75%, again, whether that's an actual load prescription or a percentage of estimated one or M, I'm going to perform say about 10 reps, right? Uh, to failure. That's, that's around my 10 rep max. Um, so I'll, and it like, say it's an RAR stop of two or RP stop of eight. You can have that rep target of eight reps. That's totally fine. And then maybe around reps five, six, seven, you're kind of checking in with yourself briefly and just making sure, okay, that eight is reasonable. Or, you know, maybe after that eighth rep, you're like, oh, that actually felt pretty good. I'm going to hit another one or two reps. So it's not mutually exclusive because I don't want that to be the only focus um, with an RER t- stop type approach of just like, oh, am I there yet? Am I there yet? Um, but I think, I guess the point I'm making is RER stops, I think are pretty underutilized. And if I had to, select one set termination method exclusively, it would 1000% be that. I almost never use set termination uh, with velocity. There's there's uh, some very serious practical limitations. And I think as we're going to get into, it's probably best to use descriptively and maybe to inform any load adjustments or to just generally describe the nature of the training program as opposed to, again, tell you whether you should do that next rep or rack the barbell. Yeah, I totally agree. That's basically, if I do use that termination, it's going to be subjective RER, just like you said, in the, in the exact ways that you mentioned. Um, okay. So yeah, let, let's shift gears here and let's kind of talk about some of the potential use cases we see for velocity loss instead of just highlighting its potential limitations as a set termination method. To be clear, once again, we definitely don't think that velocity loss is absolutely useless. That's not in any way, shape, or form what we were trying to get across. Just that if you're utilizing it to terminate sets with a goal to control for the repetitions in reserve of a set, probably a little bit limited. But there's definitely some other applications in which it could be useful. So the, kind of one of the first things that I think it's potentially useful for is kind of like you said, like a descriptive variable. And what I mean by that is something that you record the information, take it down and use that to either potentially modify protocols in kind of the long term or potentially modify the load or the, the, the number of repetitions you're performing um, to keep that within a desirable range. Now, right off the bat, what is a desirable range has some potential limitations to it for the reasons that we discussed. Just as a basic example, there's a few studies that seem to suggest like, um, you know, less than 40% velocity loss is maybe a bit better for strength. I don't want to go down a huge tangent why that's the case. We don't really know. It kind of manipulates proximity to failure and the volume of training. So there's a lot of things moving around there, but generally speaking, that seems to be a bit better for strength. Thus, you may want to keep that below 40%. The difference in what we're saying is I'm not setting up my velocity unit to beep when velocity loss touches 40% or whatever. I'm just going to view that after the set. And in addition to all the other programming parameters of a given protocol, I might adjust the load or adjust the number of repetitions to keep that within a given range. That, that would be using it descriptively. And I think it definitely has some potential utility there. I think there is a a little bit more research that needs to be done to kind of really figure out what a given velocity loss threshold really means. Cause like I said, just from a purely scientific standpoint, multiple variables are being manipulated. So I want to know, do we need to manipulate multiple variables to elicit the desired effect, meaning they're actually synergistic or is it one or the other? Is it, is it just volume or is it just proximity to failure? We don't really know. So there's a few, questions that I still have before I have a really tight and confident understanding that this is definitely something that should influence our protocols. That said, I think you can definitely take the stance that, you know, you could use it to, to inform some things. So I think it's a really, really good proxy of just generally speaking, interest at fatigue. And one example that I think that can that, that this, that highlights its utility in comparison to what we're saying is that if I terminate sets, with a method that only really cares about RAR, that is kind of load independent. 
And from a set termination perspective, that's a benefit that, that it makes it easier to set up a profile and it kind of keeps things the same kind of regardless of the conditions and makes everything's really simple. However, from a tracking perspective and an adaptation perspective, there could be differences related to a given proximity to failure at different loads and velocity loss picks up on this. So if we take a set to failure with 30% of one RM versus 80% of one RM, the total velocity loss is going to be greater from 30% of one RM. And generally speaking, lower loads close to failure versus higher loads close to failure is going to lead to a bit more fatigue. So that is an example where that may pick up on that additional fatigue, whereas just looking at the RIR of a set would not. And so that is where I think it is potentially useful as that kind of descriptive tool to suggest the kind of the fatigue of a protocol or things like that, where uh, just relying on the RIR of a set probably wouldn't tell you that. Um, that that's, that's really the primary benefit that I see for it. Um, and that's going to help you plan out microcycles. That's going to help you decide how kind of the, the loading range potentially that you may want to use for a given sl slot, depending on the goal that could influence periodization, for example, like if you want intraset fatigue in certain training phases, you may select certain variables because of that. If you don't want intraset fatigue in certain training phases, you may select protocols or variables in a way to elicit that. So that is where I really think velocity loss shines is it's that kind of descriptive variable that can be a rough proxy of the training stress slash stimulus provided, but also the fatigue cost um, kind of that comes from multiple variables. Um, additionally, there seems to be, you know, a, a decent relationship to kind of uh, to, to, to support what I just said there. There seems to be a pretty strong relationship between velocity loss and kind of various markers of training load. Um, you know, things like decrements and counter movement jump, lactate, um, kind of more exertion based RPE, those kind of things seem to be pretty, you know, consistently related to a given velocity loss kind of spectrum of thresholds, which kind of supports what I'm saying is that it can be a useful descriptive variable to kind of relate to the fatigue or the uh, training stress that you're delivering with a given protocol. So by tracking that, you can roughly see, is this in kind of the range that I want it to be? Now, the difficult part gets to be, okay, where are those cutoffs of what is acceptable and what's not acceptable? But that doesn't mean those can't be established over time using it consistently and knowing what you're kind of trying to use it for. I think those, you kind of get familiar with a tool that doesn't mean just because it's complicated initially doesn't mean the tool is completely invalid. It just takes some work to get familiar with the measurements specifically on an individual basis, different lifts, different loading ranges, different sets, et cetera. Um, but over time, I think it can be useful for that reason and, and definitely I think that's where it shines in comparison to just caring about the RER, which obviously has some uh, limitations. Yeah. It would also probably be more useful with higher RERs. So this is probably going to be more applicable with um, like sport performance training, where you probably, where, where a lot of cases in that context, you're going to want very minimal velocity loss. And if you have like a group setting, especially, okay, we can't create these profiles. Maybe you don't want the athletes really worrying about RER or whatever the case may be. Sure. You could have a velocity unit, a give velocity feedback, right? Which, which can be helpful and has been shown to actually increase velocity just by, by a means of kind of playing that game of seeing it and getting that immediate feedback. And if you have the thing such 10% um, velocity loss, because you want minimal velocity loss, then that's, that's a great way to go. Because even with, um, you know, poor session to session, um, reliability and differences between individuals and differences between sets, 10% velocity loss isn't going to be, you know, close to failure almost no matter what, so long as it's not like 95% plus. So in that context, when it's like, all right, yeah, there's issues here, but the difference is going to be, you know, 10 RAR or 12 RAR, that doesn't really matter. Um, so in that case, it could definitely be useful as well. Um, so I wanted to bring that up because I think people that might disagree with us would probably come from more that side of things, um, more of the sport performance side of things. And, and just to really, really emphasize what we said before is like, we're, we're kind of assuming you care about RAR for whatever reason, which, which is the position that we hold. 
but that's also specific to kind of the, the training that, that we talk about with, with our podcast and, and, and with our clients and whatnot. So, um, yeah, definitely some utility. So I hope we've, we've nailed that home. Um, and also again, can be useful on the group level. Yeah. Yeah. I completely agree. I think those are kind of the, those are, those are the primary, uh, cases for it, both in kind of the applications that we talk the most about, but also in other applications, I, I definitely agree in like, a you know, in a, if you're working with like team sports athletes and you don't have time to set up RIR ACV profiles, um, that require some, a decent amount of legwork and you know, the exercise they're going to be performing. There's some decent group bubble data out there. You know, roughly speaking, this velocity loss threshold is going to be in the, in the approximate range. Then I think that's a, that's a pretty, pretty safe way to go. And that's going to be probably getting quite a bit of benefit of the auto regulation component of it, the velocity based training component that's going to encourage maximal concentric intent. And then also the auto regulation of both proximity to failure and volume, just like you said, like you're, it's kind of a shotgun approach that definitely has some utility in kind of those cases. So definitely don't just want to throw that out. Um, because of those reasons. And, and in those applications as well, just based on some of my digging on this topic, kind of trying to tease out which of those two variables from, from the velocity loss perspective seems to be related to some of those kind of neuromuscular adaptations. I, I would say that the, the volume control specifically in team sports athletes is probably pretty darn important where the resistance training isn't the outcome they care about, right? They, they, they want to save most of their recovery capacity for the stuff that actually matters, particularly in season. And so manipulating that volume alongside proximity to failure, in our case, maybe a limitation because we have volume set at a particular level for a reason. But in that case, kind of having a, a method that kind of controls both at the same time may be useful um, just to kind of control the overall dosage of training when that's just a proxy to get better at your sport rather than the sport itself. So I think that's a, that's a, that's another, um, reason to, to kind of let it shine in kind of those scenarios. Yeah. Um, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. I was just going to briefly outline where I'm kind of at with, with lifters that I work with and how I would incorporate velocity completely descriptive. Um, there's some cases where, you know, we'll kind of have like a, a load velocity profile set up. So a load velocity profile is different than an RER velocity profile, right? So a load velocity profile is basically, okay, this velocity is, you know, indicative of 70% of one RM. This velocity is indicative of 80%. Whereas RER ACV profiles are, Okay, this velocity correlates with three RER, and that's relevant for multi rep sets, probably above four or five reps. I'd say I'd say four reps and above is is kind of my best guess, and where I found it to be the most reliable, and I think as as evidence based as we can get right now. But anyway, that that would really be the only time where I would kind of actually set up programming constraints based on velocity is using that load velocity profile and basically saying, hey, if if a warm up exceeds this velocity, then don't make that next jump up. Cause that means that next jump up is probably going to be an overshoot or whatever the case may be. Um, or like, Hey, we've already kind of achieved the desired top set protocol and, and we're in the ballpark of your, the, the percentage of one RM we kind of want to achieve on that day. Um, but honestly, I don't, I don't use that a ton, but if, if I, if in, in the few cases I do use it prescriptively, that's the only case right now. I used to have some folks do RER stops it just gets tough because velocity is a little bit finicky. It takes a second or two for the, the velocity to actually, or for the unit to actually spit out the velocity. It can be a little bit distracting. So again, um, I think you can get all the benefits of velocity based training, but just by being descriptive with it. And if you just write down first rep velocity for top sets and last rep velocity for back offsets, you can roughly estimate, you know, this was the percentage one RM for the top set. And this was the RAR of the back offset. And you can make adjustments accordingly and, you know, kind of confirm whether your RAR rating was accurate or not, uh, or say, Hey, maybe that's a little bit off, or maybe there's additional context there, like a misgroove. And it's also importantly, another way to measure progress. So I love seeing, you know, okay, two weeks out in cycle a, you know, for this top set, at the same exact load or, or maybe a little bit heavier velocity was X. And now in cycle C, you know, a few months later, two weeks out, we hit the same load or a heavier load and, and velocity was Y. And that's a really, really nice comparison 
um, in addition to footage and um, RAR ratings, just to kind of have that much more confidence. Um, so that's, again, just really descriptively. And I'd also say, just to hopefully not be too negative about velocity, um, or, or at the risk of sounding too negative of, about velocity, I have some some individuals that have velocity units that don't use them because we've decided it's just not worth it because there is a cost at times to having that additional thing to worry about, both in terms of just complexity and, you know, sometimes a misgroove can spit out a velocity you don't love and that can kind of get in your head. Or maybe it's just, you know, we want to focus on this cue as opposed to, you know, just really worrying about moving it as fast as you can to get the best possible velocity value. And, and that can be a net negative at times. Um, so again, like RAR, that's home base, making sure those ratings are as accurate as possible. Then you layer that on descriptively, um, you know, even when, even when using it in, in the, the load velocity profiles or the load R or the, um, RAR velocity profiles. Um, I just figured throwing that out there might be helpful because I, I've probably changed my position on that a little bit. Um, in the past six to 12 months. Uh, I'm, I'm with you hundred percent. Like there's, there's so many kind of assumptions that are easy to kind of skip over with like really strongly utilizing velocity based training. Like the easiest one is just like the maximal concentric intent thing. Like I go back and forth on that. Like, I, I think it's, I think it is important to try to do that to best your ability, but the reality is it's just for, for some situations, it's just not feasible. Like it, it, it just isn't. Um, and so that is going to compromise your ability to kind of utilize it to some degree, because now we don't know if the de decrements in velocity are coming from a lack of intent or fatigue uh, oriented parameters. So that kind of throws off everything a bit. Now, you can make the argument if you're consistently using the the <laughs> slight submaximal intent that can kind of hopefully account for that a little bit, but I still don't think it's perfect. Even, even in that case, like, um, you really need to use maximal concentric intent for it to best map onto kind of the, the fatigue relationship, which for us is, is kind of indicative of RER, at least what, that's what we care about. Um, so yeah, I, I'm with you there. I think I've gradually used it less over time and I'm a hundred percent on the same page, particularly in the context that we're talking about 95% of the time, strength sports, physique sports, et cetera using it as kind of the um, criteria for jumps of top sets, I think is a really, really good way to use it. Um, just because that, that a lot of times in the way programs are kind of designed, that kind of influences the rest of the workout most of the time. And if you're using kind of the objectivity to determine the, the part that people generally get the most excited about, I think that's where it really shines. And then some of the other stuff, you can use it descriptively to kind of tell people, um, are they accurate with their RERs, et cetera, to make sure that the, the rest of the workout is in kind of a good spot. But if you kind of screw up that, that first top set, you know, you're going into back offs with a little bit more fatigue and the intent isn't there. It, it just, it kind of can, it can snowball to have a, have a poor workout if, if, if your uh, top set kind of gets um, funky pretty quick. And I think velocity is good in, in, in that, uh, regard. Um, but yeah, man, I, I think, I think we kind of touched on a lot of the stuff here. I think that we have like one more kind of thought experiment I'll pose to you here to kind of close this out. Um, now presumably, presumably some of the variability that we saw from, from the Jukic analysis is going to be due to like measurement error just natural fluctuations and day-to-day -day variability, et cetera. But let, let's say let's say a good amount of it is due to actual individual level fluctuation um, from like a given a, a given lifter. What do you think those those different decay patterns in velocity tell us or inform programming at a given load? Um, what, what do you what do you think that tells us? What do you think that can um, inform us what to do with kind of our programming strategies on a day-to-day -day basis and things we may, may or may not have to account for. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, but I'm very interested in this question. Like I've noticed that there can be cases, this is similar conceptually, but a different example, right? Cause you're kind of talking about, you know, for, for a multi-rep set with say 75%, that decay pattern of velocity can be different session to session. And basically you're asking what might that be indicative of? Um, another like kind of similar in concept example that I've seen is like velocity. Um, 
specifically for, for like a top set, right? First rep velocity is like very, very good. Maybe it's like velocity PRs on the way up, but then it quickly falls off um, in certain contexts, but not others. Like what I'll notice is when I'm, when I'm tapered, that kind of good velocity performance for top sets continues to until a higher percentage. Whereas if I feel like I'm under fatigue, maybe once I get to 92 and a half percent, um, again, I'm hitting velocity PRs on a really good day, um, up till that point, but then it just kind of like disproportionately falls off at a rate that's different than if I were to continue to make that jump after tapering. Um, it's been a while since I've looked at the kind of research on changes in, or, or I should say stability of load velocity profiles. But last I checked, um, they're, they're, they seem pretty good. Um, but in my, in my experience, that isn't always the case. And I don't know why, I don't know why that would be the case. I, I'm kind of speculating that it's related to fatigue levels in some way. So maybe we're just completely freaking off base. And the fact that it isn't stable session to session is a feature, not a bug. Obviously we don't totally think that cause you know, we've said everything we've set up to this point, but um, maybe there is something there. And for those that are sticking around towards minute 50, 45, 46 of the episode um, are probably interested in us speculating on this. So that was me pointing out the problem, but not really giving out, giving a good solution. So I'm not sure if you have additional thoughts. But I cheated. I asked the question so I could think about it. Um, well, I kind of think I think you're on the money. Um, the way that I thought about it was, again, theoretically, we're saying that it's because of some you know individual level factor. There's other things that go into the variability observed, but let's just have the thought experiment that is due to individual level kind of changes and such. Um, there's been some interesting stuff that I've kind of like skimmed. I haven't gone through it with a fine tooth comb by any means, but like short-term alterations to like rate of force development, things like that, that kind of come along with fatigue. And then there's also short-term alterations that come along with tapering to things like that, like fiber type characteristics, et cetera, that seem to be related to those things as well that I wonder if could kind of play a role here in the sense that if you enter a session fatigued or lack thereof, that could definitely influence kind of the, the RAR slope, I guess, is, is kind of the, the way to think about it. Um, to which initially I, I shared kind of what you were saying is like a feature, not a bug with velocity loss. I also think you could make the argument that that's why it's really important to be precise with your RARs, because if you can kind of identify where those breaks happen, a one or two RAR shift now where you think doing an extra rep isn't a big deal. Now you just increase the, 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 or decrease the RIR substantially compared to what your target was. And while doing that on an, one individual set is never really a big issue, but if you accumulate multiple, multiple sets like that over a block, over an entire training cycle, that could deliver a substantially different stimulus than kind of what you intended. Um, so that, yeah, that, that's, that's kind of what I was thinking is that it does seem like there's some variability in that kind of that velocity RIR slope over time doesn't necessarily mean that the, the the velocities and their relationship to an RAR value are different. It just means that if I complete 10 reps in a row, it may go from 10, 9, 8, 7, 6 to a velocity associated with a 5 RAR to 2 RAR much more quickly for a variety of reasons. Um, so, yeah, I, it, we definitely don't have an answer there. I just thought that was something and kind of an interesting potential implication of these results to some degree that made me kind of just think about how that may influence kind of session to session setup and expectations and, and things like that. Yeah. Um, so yeah, this is, like you said, this is definitely just the, uh, us throwing stuff on the wall and seeing what sticks. No super well-formed thoughts here, but I definitely think that is interesting. And, and maybe, maybe this is a, definitely a stretch is kind of evidence of accumulated fatigue in a way. Um, mm. But I, I know there's definitely arguments against that, um, that, um, not, necess not necessarily accumulated. I guess I'm making the assumption that if you were to perform, you know, three sessions in a row, that slope would change in an expectable way, yeah. which could, could be, could be a, a faulty assumption, but, um, yeah. Uh, the, the, the accumulated fatigue stuff is something I think about a lot. We did that yeah. episode with Drake. Yeah. Um, I think, 
I think the the notion of accumulated fatigue is a little bit off base. I know, I know what you're saying here, um, but I just like to. So you know, I'm wrong. Thanks. Yeah. I, no, I like to. I like to. You know, waste time on useless semantics. Um, <laughs> so, I guess what you're from a practical perspective, at least, if I'm thinking through this properly, um, which I'm kind of thinking through it live here. Even if that was the case, RERACV profiles would would catch that, right? If if that decay rate kind of changed, and maybe that was yeah. indicative of something we did care about, it would, it would more so. It would more so. It would basically the way that I think about it is like yes, first and foremost, the RERACV should account for that. Like mm-hmm. a set could go from having a linear decrease in RER for every single repetition mm-hmm. in terms of the velocity associated RER mm-hmm. from five hit a cliff. Now I only have one rep in the tank, whereas right. the velocity would be a different pattern there. Um, I think RERACV would pick up on that. It's just that, why is that, why is that occurring? And, and right. could there be some sort of programming implication from like a weekly, you know, template or setup perspective of like anticipating that or, mm-hmm. you know, that kind of thing. Um, like if, if we want RER to be precise, for reasons and we know that fatigue maybe is going to alter the decay rate of velocity and its relationship to RIR. Maybe we program in a different way because of that. I don't know mm-hmm. what, you, what you do necessarily, but just the interesting. We, we want you, RIR to be <laughs> precise for reasons. Yeah. You like that, right? <laughs> yeah. Nice. <man. laughs> um, no, it's, it's, it's an interesting thought. Um, I don't know. I mean, if, if you're no longer, if, if your ability to maintain high force production with a given load falls off quicker at some points compared to others, it's probably indicative of something going on under the hood that might be of use. I, I, my initial guess is probably not of massive concern for a power lifter. Yeah. Um, but nonetheless, you know, just to fully conceptualize this issue, I think you, or, or this concept, I think you have to consider what might be going on there. Um, and this is why velocity loss, you know, we don't spend a ton of time thinking about athletic, like real sport applications. Um, but maybe, maybe, you know, people that have thought through this a lot more for that application, they're like, no, velocity loss is telling us exactly what, what we want to do. Um, but kind of just kind of talking about velocity in general, man, it can be finicky. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. like, you know, you, you kind of run into this issue where if you want to stop a set at a three RER, but then a velocity jumps from what corresponds with the five RER all the way to one RER. And then the next set, it like you hit like 12 reps at five RER. It's obviously an exaggeration, but it's just, it's just pretty finicky. Um, especially with certain exercises and seemingly with, with some individuals more than others, maybe that's a maximal concentric content thing. I don't know, um, but I think it just is important. I, I, I would just, I, it's important to acknowledge that velocity can be finicky and it's not perfect. And it also turns out that some people with not the longest ranges of motion, sometimes the velocity devices don't even like to pick up the velocities and that can run into issues too. Um, and also really, really, really slow velocities often aren't picked up by some, by some units. Um, and no, we would no only, uh, specific units were mentioned in the making of this video. Yeah. No specific units were, were mentioned or individuals, but, um, yeah. And it's just, I go back and forth, right? Cause I think we've probably been a little bit negative about velocity, but it's, it's a really, really nice addition to training when this, used is, this, properly. Is, this is the way I kind of like to view it. Not sorry to cut you off, but I, I got to get back for early in the episode. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I do, I really do think it is a physiological principle like that, that I think like if you were able to like isolate a machine human that doesn't exist, like I do think like the relationships make sense right. from a physiology perspective. I think if you put them in a perfectly stable exercise in which you can use truly ballistic concentric intent with no fear of mm-hmm. falling on your back during a deadlift, I think all these relationships would play out like mm-hmm. as, as perfectly as one could reasonably expect given mm-hmm. human stuff. Um, it's just when you start layering all these practical considerations on in terms of like how yeah. we actually use it, free weight exercises, um, you know, 
it's very challenging to use truly maximal ballistic intent on every single repetition. That's very mentally draining, but also just mm -hmm. like the skill of doing that is something you have to be very conscious about on every single rep with low enough loads that literally requires like you coming off the ground in a squat, for example. Like I've talked about this study a few times. The the study by Thompson and colleagues is the best one or M prediction study from velocity that I'm aware of. And they used a, pro, uh, a profile that combined jump squats and normal squats with low enough loads because if you're truly using maximal concentric intent with a low enough load you'll come off the ground which any you know power lifter is probably not doing that um and, and so that that's another consideration and so it's just you kind of start layering all those things on in addition to the fact if you misgroup or misgroup a rep slightly you could say that as a feature of velocity in the sense that it's giving you feedback on that meaning that your bar path wasn't perfectly efficient, but it also is going to influence all of these profiles in reference to like a true physiological sense, I guess. Like, yeah, like that's going to influence the, the upwards change of that, right? Like you could have right. a velocity decay, but I didn't decay here because of fatigue. I decayed because I completely ruined my bar path on a bench press. Right. I fixed it on the next rep and now the decay pattern looks weird. Um, right. All of those things make it so that it's, absolutely a useful tool and like you said yeah. i definitely don't want to be too negative it's just that the further we stray from like the absolute pristine probably unrealistic conditions that it gets mm -hmm. you know something that i would say the moral of this episode i would say less about velocity loss and more in velocity in general yeah probably use it descriptively rather than prescriptively i think it's yeah. probably the um pun intended prescription <laughs> yeah and, i and and i think i think the point you just made leads to a very helpful practical take home in that view your RAR profile, your, your RAR velocity or load velocity profiles as living, breathing profiles and not something that's set in stone. Like if you expect to have this perfect RAR ACV profile from one set to failure or this perfect load velocity profile from one testing session, you're probably going to be a little bit disappointed. Um, I've, I have velocity profiles on myself starting in like late 2019, early 2020. And at this point, I feel really, really good about them. And it's very rare that my subjective RER and my velocities differ by more than one. And I absolutely, like, I think training enjoyment is like meaningfully increased personally from using velocity. So again, we've kind of like talked down on velocity and said it's not for everybody and there's a lot of limitations. But at the same time, I will be the first to tell you, I enjoy a lot of training sessions considerably more because I have velocity. Um, like, it turns out you can't hit, you know, maxes every single day, which is what a lot of people get excited for. But if you have a single at RP7 or a single at RP6 in an intro week, whatever the case may be, and you know what you hit in that intro week eight weeks ago, in this, uh, in, in, in cycle a, and now you're in cycle B and you have kind of something to beat. It just kind of puts you in this interesting flow state that I don't think is as motivating. Um, if you, if you didn't have that now, that's also because it aligns with my personality and I just kind of enjoy that. Whereas other people are like, this is, this is not really for me. And that's cool too. But I, I really enjoy another example is five sets of six back offs and they're hanging out in like the RP five to seven range. Right. Um, if I can just play this game of like, I'm going to do everything I can so that last rep velocity doesn't meaningfully decrease, decrease throughout these sets. Um, I'm probably going to slightly improve the, the enjoyment I have during those, those back off sets and also probably the quality of those sets. And maybe I cross my T's and dot my eyes with the way I put my wrist wraps on for that last set, just because I'm a little bit more engaged. Um, and I, I personally benefit from that a lot too. Um, and it just kind of gamifies things, right? Is, is what I'm saying. So I would, I would have felt a little bit of regret if I didn't mention that here, cause kind of looking back on the last hour, we've definitely talked, we we've pointed out a lot of limitations, but they're there. It does meaningfully improve training if used properly. And it kind of jives with your personality. I think, I think the way I'm going to leave this off, cause my camera is about to die. So we're going to finish this up here. Um, the, the way that I think you can kind of show that, it probably is worth a little, a little bit of the headache that takes in kind of using it. A lot of, a lot of really reputable coaches, including us kind of, if clients are interested in probably, probably say make the plunge for a lot of them. And I think that tells you 
a lot about just like generally speaking, a lot of coaches find that having that tool is something that's useful um, based on the fact that they are, you know, encouraging their clients to do it if it's something they're interested in. That said, I don't think it's absolutely make or break for progression by any means, but definitely considering all the things that we said today, I think it's something that can absolutely benefit training, not only from a prescription standpoint, um, programming standpoint, description standpoint, but also from the psychological factors and enjoyment, like Josh said. Um, so with that in mind, thanks for staying through this episode. I think this was uh, definitely took uh, a little bit of a different turn than I expected coming in, but I thought this was a really interesting conversation that uh, hopefully the listeners enjoyed. As always, if you want to support the show, leave a five-star rating and review on your podcast platform of choice. Um, and yeah, Thanks for tuning in and we'll be back in two weeks to discuss something else that hopefully is uh, as interesting as this. So um, thanks everyone. And hopefully uh, we'll uh, continue to put out some stuff that's uh, worth listening to. So take care.